Hello, everybody, and welcome. I'm Gary Jesh with Power Transmission Engineering. I'd like to welcome you today to our webinar presented by Daiqua Corporation. Uh, now, you know, uh, because gearboxes are used in practically every industry, engineers often have to come up with creative solutions to a wide variety of unusual challenges. Now, what happens when there are specific challenges presented, whether it be environmental, safety, or applications? Now, how can a gearbox work in extreme conditions, like uh, Antarctica, for example? So well, today we'll be learning about the process of applying custom designs for our unique applications. And we have as our presenter, Daiqua President Michael Quas, who will share multiple examples and case studies of gearbox inventions that his company has built for customers from around the world. And I'd like to welcome Michael. Good day, Mike, how are you doing today? I'm doing very well, thank you. Fantastic. Uh, now, Mike, uh, Michael Kloss is the uh, president and the owner of Daiqua Corporation. He's a degreed mechanical engineer himself from the University of Illinois. And he's the second generation owner of Daiqua, been serving as president since 1998. And Mike is also active on a daily basis on the engineering and sales floor. And he's constantly working with customers, creating engineered solutions to a constant stream of power transmission applications. So Mike, we're going to get started here. I think that uh, we have um, a nice group of folks here attending and uh, visiting us today. And uh, you have some very interesting examples to share with us. So uh, how about if we get started? Are you ready on your end today? I certainly am. The first slide that we're showing up here is uh, basically how we function. So we are a business that's been in business for many, many years, since about 1990. Um, and we are a manufacturer um, and creator of many different types of gearbox solutions. This slide is just kind of showing what our, our overall philosophy is in terms of how we approach the market. So of course we have many standard type products and uh, if the application is relatively straightforward uh, and standard products apply, fantastic, then, uh, then we can work in that direction. But we also can take a look at using standard gearboxes and modifying them slightly. So there are many times where applications don't require uh, you know, extreme conditions. And in those cases, you know, we can we can coat them with epoxy, we can change the bearings out, we can change the um, the lubricants out or, or whatever makes sense for a particular application. And we can get all the way to the point where we are doing complete redesigns. In other words, right from the ground up. So we have to design the gear strength, we have to design the housing, we have to design uh, how a particular gearbox is going to be driven, whether it's with a servo motor, with a line shaft, with a AC motor, or whatever the case may be. And so we have all of those kinds of things at our disposal. And um, we, we very often get a lot of customers come to us with very, very unusual applications, um, or they come to us with uh, with issues where the, pro where the gearboxes they currently have in use are just not holding up, and we need to figure out why. So what I want to do today uh, is kind of run through a variety of what I'll call case studies where we took some real world applications where we have solved um, uh, certain engineering issues uh, associated with, uh, with a particular application. Uh, and they can range from uh, environmental issues, safety issues, um, high torque issues, um, maximum uptime you know where a gearbox is not allowed to fail if you will otherwise it causes massive amounts of uh, downtime with a factory and so on so let's jump it right in and uh, take a look at the very first um, application and this one is um, i'm sure kind of close to my heart as, as maybe to many others that are listening and uh, that's a beer bottle filling application. I like beer. Um, so obviously when the breweries, uh, there was a particular brewery out in Colorado approached us and said, hey, we've got some equipment out here. Our main driveline for the filling station, the gearboxes are not lasting. They're only lasting on average 12 and 14 weeks and, um, and they're failing. And uh, we need to figure out why they're failing and, and we need to come up with a, with a long-term solution um, for what's going on with with uh, with this particular uh, problem to give everybody a sense of what a, a beer bottle filling unit looks like this is kind of a, a representation i took off the web this is basically a 
It's a, a large round device. It has um, got a major gearbox, a large gearbox underneath it that drives that, that rotating turret, uh, this turret right here. And the, the bottle would enter the turret, uh, and then as it goes around, it gets filled, and it comes out, goes into a capper sometimes if it's a bottle, and then uh, also in, then possibly into a labeling machine or some other you know, downstream equipment uh, before it goes uh, into packaging and so forth. So it was the drive system for this large machine that was failing. And to give you a sense of what that gearbox looks like, uh, this is the box that's underneath. Um, you can kind of see some corrosion already starting around this particular unit. Um, they are, when they're in operation, they are bathed with um, excess beer. And uh, often in bottling lines, they use soapy water as a means to lubricate the, uh, the pathway that the beer bottle has to run down. Um, uh, d during its processing as it's being, you know, cleaned and filled and, and, uh, and so forth. Um, so this gearbox is kind of in a nasty environment. And the failures that we were seeing that the customer was showing us uh, had a lot to initially to do with the seals failing. And that is primarily because here you see on the shafts, you saw a lot of rust. Uh, beer happens to be a fairly corrosive uh, material. Um, and also during the washdown process, when they sanitize these uh, pieces of equipment from, from time to time as part of their process, that caustic washdown solution is also incredibly corrosive. Um, this is what the, what the lubricant looked like after a very short time. This is, um, and when you open these boxes, when they're returned to us, they they're, don't smell very good. <laughs> it's just kind of nasty in there, but it's a combination of uh, oil and beer and water and uh, other chemicals that are used to actually clean the, the units as they're, as they're being used. And um, obviously, uh, with no, you get all those contaminants inside the gearbox, the lubrication property, the oil just uh, is destroyed almost immediately. And then bearings fail. Um, and then you start seeing other problems with the uh, gear sets failing and the gears wearing excessively and so on. Um, another example, this is uh, a pinion cap. This is actually vertical in the, in the gearbox. Doesn't see a lot of oil up there and you can kind of see the corrosion that is on the inside of the gearbox. And normally we never see anything like this un unless something's actually seeping into the unit. So um, we had to solve this problem. What's first of all causing the oil and the nastiness to get into the gearbox? And then, uh, you know, how do we address the, all the corrosion that we're seeing um, in a way that doesn't, um, that retains the strength characteristics for the shafting and other components of the gearbox. Um, this took a little while to figure out, to be to be very honest. Um, and the engineers at the at the plants actually took a look at this and were convinced that it was a seal issue. That uh, and then they tried all kinds of different, very expensive uh, labyrinth seals and other seal solutions. And actually, um, I flew out to uh, to this location and this particular. Um, brewery had other locations around the country, which I also visited. And what we determined is that a lot of the stuff getting into the gearbox was a direct result of um, the process that was used to sanitize the system. In this case, uh, this particular brewery, the, the filling uh, part of the line was in a special room. They would wash the equipment down with a particular solution, and then they would turn the heat up in that room to sanitize the room. So the got up to like 150 degrees or hotter uh, inside that room for a period of time. Uh, they use that in conjunction with the fluids that they uh, you sprayed the machines down with and, and then um, you know that would sanitize them. And then they'd start the units back up again and then the areas where the bottle filling takes place is also quite cold. Um, so you'd have a large uh, change in temperature. And what we found out since the box was sealed is that pressure differential was causing a vacuum inside the gearbox and as soon as the gearbox was asked to, to function again and, and the materials were the beer and the soapy water and so forth was getting all over it, it was being sucked in through the seals and, uh, and, and destroying the gearbox internally. Um, so we solved it uh, by taking a look at that and say, okay, well, how do we, how do we solve the problem with, um, with a pressure differential? And um, what we couldn't do was put just an open breather on the gearbox because we wanted to not allow any of the contaminants or moisture in the area to get in. So we actually came up with a bladder system and uh, you kind of see it in this photograph here. Uh, the bladder is, uh, this is one of the earlier prototypes. This is um, a stainless steel uh, component. It's got a Viton uh, membrane on the inside and that Viton, Viton membrane can move um, as, the, as the pressure changes inside the gearbox. 
There is a formula that we had to follow because we had to calculate just how much air was actually expanding and contracting. And um, we determined we actually needed two bladders, uh, which I'll show you in a, in a final version of this thing. The other thing that we did was we took a standard gearbox, and uh, in this case, uh, it, was, it was a little bit more of an expensive solution. We nickel plated a lot of the components. That has since changed. Um, now what we do is many of the components that we can machine internally, like this bell housing here, there's a bearing support that's uh, just below the bell housing. This end plate and this through shaft are now produced out of stainless steel. Uh, this pinion, uh, which is a one-piece pinion, so it's actually uh, an integral part of the gear, um, that we could not uh, make out of stainless because uh, the teeth wouldn't be strong enough. So in this case, instead of doing a two-piece pinion, which we don't typically like to do, um, we took this particular uh, pinion, we had it ground down by something like 30 thousandths, and then we had it uh, hard chromed, uh, about a 40 thousandths thick layer of hard chrome, and then ground back to size. So this is this whole section that sticks outside of the gearbox is chromed. Um, and then um, the, uh, these are stainless uh, keys that are in here, all stainless hardware, um, and so on. The, the final iteration actually, oh, uh, one other thing I wanted to point out, the seals themselves we covered. This is a plate that we produce that presses onto the shaft. Uh, there's a groove that we cut into the end plate and then that cavity underneath we pack with a, a, a particular type of grease uh, that doesn't break down uh, with heat um, or with, uh, it's very chemically inert. Um, so it protects the seal area so nothing can get actually pulled in and we keep the corrosion away from the seal area by doing this as well. So this plate actually spins with the shaft and it spins inside a groove that's cut into the end plate. So it's kind of a slinger solution that we came up with there. Um, so the final uh, piece kind of looks like this. Um, this is where we have uh, two bladders uh, that were attached with uh, stainless steel hardware. And then actually since this particular version, the housing, which uh, is a very expensive thing to nickel plate, uh, we now do a process called steel it paint, which is a stainless steel impregnated paint um, that has really, really good wear characteristics and corrosion protection characteristics. So this was uh, really kind of a very fascinating way to, to solve a, a problem that was uh, plaguing this particular uh, brewery and its facilities around the country. And before where they were getting 10 and 12 weeks of, of wear from this product um, and life out of this thing, now we're getting upwards of more of the life that we would expect out of these things. They're lasting about three, four to five years, depending on how many thousands of hours that the, that the um, uh, device is actually functioning. So it's, it's back to what, what, what we anticipate it should be. So let's take a look at another case study. Um, this one is actually a customer of ours that makes industrial water heaters, of all things. And you can kind of see a, a component there that's sitting on four rollers. Um, the process that they wanted us to solve was they wanted a mechanism to drive those four rollers, but they have to be co-rotating. Uh, this is part of a painting process to, to apply that ceramic coating uh, to these uh, heater components. Um, and that process of applying that coating is very particular apparently. And um, they want to, those rollers have to spin at a, at a specific speed, relatively slow uh, with a lot of control. So uh, this is what the, what the customer wanted from us. They wanted a gearbox. You can see the motor is, is uh, down below. Motor is down here. Uh, it's going through a flange. That's the screen piece here. Uh, driving this gearbox, and then the, this gearbox has to have, in essence, four pinions, which is not common. And those pinions all have to be rotating in the same direction. If you can visualize uh, being an engineer, if, if this was a one-to-one -one ratio, all of these pinions would be the same size. And because being one-to-one, -one, they would mesh internally. And if that were the case, then this wouldn't function as uh, all of these rotating in the same direction. Uh, because this one would go uh, clockwise, this one counterclockwise, clockwise, counterclockwise, if all of those gears would be meshing internally. So you can't have a one-to-one -one ratio. You have to have some kind of reducing ratio. And in this case, uh, we settled on a two-to-one ratio, which makes these pinions smaller, all four of them the same size, and then driven by a larger gear that's attached to the through shaft. And that you, then you can make all four of these rotate in the same direction. Uh, and that's how we solved that problem. 
And then the customer also wanted this uh, housing to be a little bit shorter on the top. There was some clearance issues uh, and so forth. So we took a, a spiral bevel gearbox and we created this solution for them. So this is a, a flange plate. We have um, some very uh, really reliable and good vendors uh, nearby us that can make these custom flange plates for us. And then we fabricate all the components associated with the housing. So there's one, two, three, four pinions coming out of every side of this gearbox. Um, and then we also put the same kind of shield um, on the output of these um, pinions uh, to protect the seal area as well, because apparently the overspray from the ceramic coating is um, it's very hard material. It's like a glass, if you will. And that will uh, destroy a seal area as well if, if you don't uh, if you don't protect it. So this was an example where we took a, a spiral bevel and um, and we modified it uh, to give you basically four uh, four pinions all rotating in the same direction. So it's kind of a, a, an interesting solution that we came up with. Um, this was a subsequent uh, redesign for the same piece of equipment. And um, these particular gearboxes are incredibly rare in the sense that I actually have a shaft coming out of every single side of this gearbox. And it is driven with a two-stage uh, uh, inline planetary gearbox on the front end here. So you do the multiple planetary stages. Uh, it's a higher reduction ratio. Um, and then that allows you to then use a smaller motor generate more torque through the reduction and then drive all the rollers uh, on this particular gearbox. And they used a, a fifth shaft, uh, actually a sixth shaft in this case, going vertical um, for some kind of height adjustment. I'm not sure exactly what, uh, how the customer used this, but this, was, uh, this is a very, very interesting and unique gearbox. We sell, I probably sold in the history that I've been at this company, uh, a gearbox like this maybe a dozen times max over the last you know, 25, 30 years. So they're pretty rare. And interesting, in my opinion. So here's a here's another example. Uh, this one is uh, for us was really interesting, um, and this is a, a safety issue. This is um, this is the solution that we came up here is more on the electrical side than it is on the mechanical. But let me explain how this works. I'm sure many of you are very familiar with high-rise construction. You see it all the time in in the cities that you may visit or live in, and very often on these buildings. Uh, the construction elevators are temporary and they are mounted to the outside of the building. Uh, you see these towers. Uh, these also tend to be uh, modular. And as the building increases in height, they just add to these towers. And um, the elevator can go higher and higher as the, as the building uh, is built, uh, you know, as it goes up. There are no counterweights used in these designs. Um, uh, typical elevators inside a building, when they're driven with a cable system, there's a counterweight that offsets the weight of the of the of the car itself, and then the um, motor that has to drive the unit up and down is basically sized for the payload, in other words, for the number of people that have to be in the in the unit and so on. In construction elevators, that's not done uh, simply because the cabling becomes very difficult as the building goes up. And so what you see mounted to the side of these uh, support rails here is a rack. There are gear teeth on that rack. And then there is a gear motor inside the car itself um, with the pinion that meshes with that rack. And that's what takes the car up and down. And then, of course, all the electronics are inside the car. Uh, on the outside, there's a, a cabling system for the electronics. It, 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 it pulls the uh, power off of another set of uh, rails that are actually mounted on the on this upright unit as well. Um, so in this case, the customer was looking for um, a high speed, high payload drive system. They wanted a quick disconnect for the, for the motor itself. In the, in the event they wanted to, to maintenance on the gear motor, uh, they can take the gear motor in and out of the elevator relatively quick. They wanted a special manual brake, which I will show you in a moment. And that brake needed to have a special sensor on it to detect when the uh, brake pad lining was getting too thin. Uh, in this case, there was no room for a cooling fan. So the customer had to come up with a different solution for keeping the device cool. And then of course, because we're moving people, uh, we needed to be very, very careful with the engineering calculations to make sure that we had sufficient service factor and that the gearbox was robust enough for this kind of application. And this is the solution that we came up with. Um, so you see, this is a helical bevel unit. Um, this is a, 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 the motor on it. You see the quick disconnect plug that we were able to come up with for this particular customer. 
this is the electrical hookup for the um, uh, for the electrical device that energizes and de-energizes the brake. Uh, you can see here the cabling for a sensor that's mounted inside the brake. Uh, but I always found this kind of very, very interesting. There is a hand release on this brake. And when I show you the car itself, uh, you'll understand why that hand release is there. In the event that uh, there's a power outage during the construction of these buildings, there's no way for that elevator to come down except for the people in the car to actually grab this hand release and de-energize the brake. And by de-energizing the brake, they can slowly bring the car down in a controlled fashion uh, by hand, which to me just seems a little bit crazy. I'm not sure I'd want to be in the elevator when they do that, but apparently this is a common practice with these construction elevators. And uh, this is the actual elevator uh, car that, uh, that these gear motors are in. And you can see there are four of them here. So there's one, two, three, four of them mounted in this particular car. Uh, and then down here is a, a safety device uh, in case the elevator goes into free fall. Uh, this is a centrifugal brake. Um, this is mounted basically on all elevators uh, that are in use. Uh, it's a mechanism by which if something were to happen um, that the, um, you know, an uncontrolled drop that, um, that the unit will stop and be held in place uh, until, you know, people come up and get, get people out of there. So this was a, a very fascinating application for us where we solved uh, a number of different issues uh, for this particular customer. And these elevators are actually used all over the world. Uh, this is a, a customer that's local to us here in the Chicago area. So let's take a look at another one. Um, uh, the, actually, another photo. Here's a photo where I was telling you that those uh, uprights are modular. So as the building continues to go up, they just add these sections. Uh, and this uh, is a dual car. So you see one on both sides of this uh, upright support unit. Um, and, and that's how they're used. So obviously, you know, they transport a lot of construction materials in here, drywall and HVAC stuff and electrical stuff and so on and so on, uh, until such time the interior elevators are, are built and completed. So let's talk about another application, which is more environmental uh, and how we solve that uh, particular uh, set of problems. Uh, so this is a customer that came to us and, and they have these unmanned um, sensing uh, domes, if you will, that are located in, in, uh, in Antarctica. Uh, the temperatures can get to extreme cold conditions. In this case, we had requirements that uh, these domes could get down and, and be exposed to minus 100 degree Fahrenheit weather. And, uh, and, and the gearbox is needed to function to be able to open and close a door. Uh, and inside these domes was some kind of sensor or dish or something. Uh, and for that to function, obviously the doors needed to be open and uh, be, op be able to open and close. So how do we, how do we solve that problem? Um, and we did it, uh, and this is kind of an example, just to kind of give you a, a visual of, this isn't the actual application, but these are the types of doors that, that we were opening and closing. Um, on these remote domes that uh, that were placed up uh, in, in the extreme uh, northern reaches uh, of Antarctica. And the way we solved that problem was to take, in this case, again, a spiral bevel gearbox. And uh, because they are remote, there's some sensing that needed to be done in the gearbox. And right here is a thermocouple that is mounted uh, inside the cavity of the unit. And then we actually installed, these are commercially available heaters. All we did was uh, drill and tap a couple of additional excess access holes uh, into the housing and insert these heaters. There are two of them, <clears throat> excuse me, there are two of them because the customer required some redundancy. These were unmanned uh, areas, these unmanned uh, domes, and uh, they needed, in, in the event that the thermocouple wasn't sensing any heat, uh, they needed to be able to switch over to a redundant heater to make sure that, um, you know, it, it didn't require somebody to go out and, and, and have to service these things, uh, you know, in, in severe weather conditions. So this, um, and also in this case, we used a low temperature oil, a uh, special oil. We work with a, um, an oil formulator that uh, we've been working with for many years and they, they can produce some very interesting lubricants for us. So this one happened to be one that, that does not, um, that remains, uh, has its lubricity problem, um, or not problems, it has, it retains its lubricity characteristics in extreme low temperatures, remains liquid doesn't freeze and, um, and has a very, very wide temperature range. Uh, so we were able to do that. And this upper bearing here also was sealed, uh, was uh, packed with a special grease. Um, 
because uh, the oil splash may not get up into this bearing to lubricate it for long, long periods, over long periods of time. So in, the, in that case, we also had a special seal bearing that we uh, that we had made for that upper upper location. So that was um, that was an interesting one for us as well. Um, this is um, this is actually a gearbox, um, and it is used uh, in the oil and gas world. Uh, we have a customer that manufactures large uh, valves, um, specifically for the oil and gas world. This is also a uh, part of that valve assembly that is uh, used above the Arctic Circle. Uh, they have a very, very short window where they can actually install these types of devices because the summers are, are relatively short there. And in the winter time, when these things are buried, uh, they are typically encased in ice and backfill. Um, and the only thing that's sticking above the ground is a hand wheel uh, that's used to open and close the valve. And this part is uh, buried underground. It's about 18 feet uh, underground, thereabouts. And all it does is rotate 90 degrees. So this was not an application where we had to worry so much about torque or speed. This was an application where we had to worry about ice and specifically something called ice jacking. Um, when, uh, when you have uh, standard components that are used in these types of gearboxes, specifically cast iron components like end plates are, are typically cast iron for these. Uh, and there's cavities in there where oil, or excuse me, where water can get in and freeze. Um, ice can be extremely powerful. And uh, we had to do some very, very specialized calculations to determine how large these end plate units needed to be to withstand the forces associated with ice and ice breaking those kinds of cast iron pieces. And uh, this is the design that we came up with. On the left side of this design, you kind of see an output. Uh, this is actually the input shaft. This is the output. Uh, this actually also has a uh, tower that sits on top of it. This goes vertical. This sits horizontal. Um, and this is attached actually to that hand wheel, which is uh, about 18 feet above it. This has a tube attached to it. And inside that tube, it's filled with um, a polyglycol mix, um, uh, so an antifreeze, if you will. And antifreeze uh, can be very corrosive and detrimental to the seals and the seal area. So we had also had to create a, a special a mechanism here to isolate the seal from that polyglycol mixture uh, that uh, is sitting on top of this. So again, this is uh, an application where we had uh, some very, very unique circumstances that we needed to overcome. And uh, we took, in this case, uh, a standard gearbox, and then we modified the, the input and output shafting and we modified modified the um, the attachment flanges to withstand, in this case, ice. So let's take a look at. Um, we have two more quick um, application uh, for us to take a look at. This one was really interesting for us, and this is a forestry application. And I visited some of these mills, uh, and it's really quite fascinating. They typically have uh, one spot in the mill where these logs are fed in. And then they are processed through the mill to create lumber. And uh, the more modern mills, the type of equipment that we were working with here is very high speed. Um, these logs uh, range typically from 14 to 20 inches in diameter. And they come into the mill uh, on their ends, of course. Uh, and they're coming at very high speed. They're, they're traveling somewhere between, depending on if it's a hardwood mill or a, or a pine softwood mill. Anywhere from 25 to 35 miles an hour is how fast these logs are, are flying through these conveyor systems and into the processing pieces of equipment. So you can imagine very high shock loading. Um, and these logs are large, so they have to be cut and, uh, uh, and shaped to, to be able to go through the band saws and create the boards and so on. Um, so the, the demands are very high, both from the standpoint of speed and torque. Uh, but they also need to be incredibly robust because when a log, it, it doesn't slow down when it hits the cutters, it comes in at full speed. So there's very high shock loads that are associated with uh, processing this kinds of material. And the other major parameter for us that we were uh, asked to solve is that they, there can be no downtime. Um, so there has to be uh, service factors and, and other elements of the engineering put in place here to make sure that these things last. For, for very, very many, many thousands of hours. Uh, uh, and because if, if, as I mentioned to you earlier, there's one line coming in 
And uh, if any piece of equipment on the inbound line uh, goes down, then the entire mill shuts down. And, and that, of course, is extremely costly to, uh, to the people that run these mills. So very demanding application. <clears throat> so you're processing those logs to turn them into boards that look like this. And the gearbox solution that we came up with uh, was this one. And uh, the piece of equipment that this is used on, there are two of these. I have it in this orientation, there, just so you can see the gearbox better, but actually they are in a vertical orientation. This, is, this shaft is up. It has a, in this case, a 500 horsepower electric motor driving it. It's running between 1800 and 2000 RPM. This is about uh, 18, 20 inches in diameter. The, the gear on the inside here, there's another gear on the inside here, and then these are two pinions, which are counter rotating. And then large cutter heads are mounted onto uh, these two pinions. And so there's a left one and a, light, a right one. So as the, and these machines uh, change in width uh, and, they, and they, as each log comes in, that log is scanned with a laser. And then these pieces of uh, uh, this big gearbox with these cutter heads is moved very quickly into position to process that lumber to get the maximum number of board feet out of it. Some very, very interesting design parameters here. One, we had to look at gear strength here for robustness. We need the largest teeth possible in the size that, that we needed. They had a one-to-one -one ratio, which was fine, but it was very high speed. There's very large diameter gears inside here. And we run when you're running these things at 1800 RPM, we run into something called a pitch line velocity lubrication wall. Uh, is the best way for me to describe it. In other words, uh, if you take this thing and you're spinning it, at 1800 RPM, <clears throat> where the gears mesh, there, there's a pitch diameter. That's called a pitch line. When you take that rotational speed and you convert it to a linear speed uh, and you start approaching 10 meters per second in terms of linear speed, uh, lubrication is impossible without injection. In other words, I could take that, that, that gear mesh and I could submerge it in oil and no oil would get into that gear mesh because it's running so fast. And the only way to, to solve that problem is to inject oil into the gear mesh. Um, so that's what these ports are that you see that are all over this gearbox. So there, there's a port here for the upper bearings. There's a port here for the end bearings. And, and on the other side, there are the injection ports for the actual gear mesh itself. And then these larger ports are where the oil comes out. Uh, so the, there's a big oil circulation system that is required for a gearbox that's running this fast uh, with this kind of torque um, and, uh, and speed. Um, so that was a, a very interesting application for us. And this is one where we designed from the ground up. So everything is custom on here, the housing, the gears, uh, the bearing setup, uh, and then of course the oil circulation to solve the, uh, the gear mesh and lubrication issue. So that was... That was an interesting application for us. And then the final one is what we, uh, uh, what we call our Frankenbox <coughs> type of applications. And, and you'll see why in a second. It has nothing to do with the T-Rex. But this is the world of animatronics uh, where we've, we show some really interesting application uh, solutions here. Uh, we have a company that we work with uh, that's very, very uh, big into creating uh, animatronics for people like Disney and Universal Studios and, and so forth. Um, very successful company, and um, so if you can envision for a moment, uh, I'm going to put my cursor here on this T-Rex mouth. Uh, typically, in some of these uh, animatronics like like this one, the lower jaw moves up and down. But what this customer wanted us, they wanted uh, the upper jaw and lower jaw to move. Uh, while this one's going down, the upper jaw has to go up. And then they wanted to be able to, and these jaws are quite large. They're probably... In this case, for this application, there were 15, 12 to 15 feet in diameter, uh, this, this overall mouth uh, device, if you will. And it needed to uh, kind of coordinate speech so that it had to open and close uh, to kind of mimic lips, if you will, and, and some other elements of motion that they wanted to do. So it was going to be driven with a servo. And, uh, and we needed to cut with a single servo motor, not two. They wanted a single servo motor, and then they wanted that particular motion uh, type profile. So what we came up with was this box, which is very, very unique. Uh, you see at the bottom of this box uh, a square flange. This is where the servo motor was attached to. 
we took a spiral bevel gearbox uh, here with two pinions. And the reason that we drove on the output shaft or the through shaft typically of this gearbox is we wanted these to be counter rotating. And then on the ends of these, we put large uh, planetary gearboxes that have what's called a robot flange. There's a large face on the, on the front of this gearbox and on the front of this gearbox, which they can attach their hardware to. And then this uh, a set of holes was uh, attached to the frame. Uh, internal frame of the device. Uh, so this was a, a very, very interesting uh, application. We call it a Franken box because we are actually taking a number of different types of gearbox types, in this case a spiral bevel and a planetary, and we combine them into a overall design that gives the customer the motion that they're looking for, uh, the torque they're looking for, and um, quite honestly, there's no gearbox on the market that even looks like this, so we had to create it. And, um, and these are really interesting and, and fun solutions for us. As a matter of fact, the uh, customer actually had another application uh, which um, they wanted us to solve and, and we used kind of a similar approach, but in this case, uh, these are co-rotating. So here we're driving on a pinion and we're driving the through shaft. So this, both of these guys are going in the same orientation. This is a... Um, also a planetary gearbox, but with a right angle bevel set inside. So again, uh, here's the square flange for a servo input through a, a coupling mechanism, uh, through the pinion, through the through shaft, and then the output into these two gearboxes. Again, to create a very interesting and special motion, uh, type of motion that the customer is looking for for his design. So um, in review, I would kind of come into the uh, end of our webinar here. Uh, what I really wanted to just impart upon all of you was the fact that you you don't necessarily have to rely on just standard designs out there in the market space. There are companies like ours uh, that can work with you to come up with a design, either utilizing a standard gearbox with relatively minor modifications uh, to gearboxes that are totally custom from the ground up to, to solve a particular motion profile that, that you have, or to work in an environment um, uh, that you need the gearbox to work in. So we talked about, uh, you know, that beer application where we, we created something that, that, was, um, that had longevity in kind of a, a harsh environment, extreme cold conditions, you know, things, ways that we can modify gearboxes to operate in those situations, and also gearboxes that are buried. Um, we also have gearboxes that are submerged in water and have to function. There's some um, water reclamation projects uh, where we have gearboxes that are about uh, submerged about 20 feet underwater uh, that have to function. In those cases, we reverse the seals, as an example, uh, some of the ways that we seal those gearboxes. Um, we talked about some extreme mechanical requirement applications. The, the elevator one is a perfect example of that, uh, or the... <clears throat> excuse me, or the uh, forestry industry one is another example. Um, the Franken box, which is uh, something that we'd love to produce because that really uh, gets our creative juices flowing here where we can, uh, you know, come up with these uh, gearboxes that we cobble together from, from a lot of different types of uh, gearbox technologies to come up with uh, a gearbox that'll meet something special that you're looking to do. And then, of course, uh, we do complete custom designs where, you know, we, we have to design the, the gear teeth, the bearing system, uh, the housings, the input and output shafts, uh, and how they have to connect and mount and so forth. So um, I imparted upon you, hopefully, uh, a little bit of information about what's possible, and, and that's really what, what we're trying to do. Uh, these gearboxes and, and these types of solutions are by no means the limit of what we're capable of doing. There are literally thousands of applications that we have solved uh, using this kind of uh, design philosophy. And um, I, I hope that the, you know, that this um, little talk that I gave here was interesting and, and was able to give you some ideas about what's possible. And, uh, and if you have applications that are a little unusual or you have difficult situations that you're trying to solve, please give us a call. Uh, you know, we'd be happy to work with you. That's uh, picture of me up in the corner there so you get a sense of who I am. Uh, there's our contact information and uh, Gary I think uh, we're going to turn it back over to you for some questions and uh, questions and answer session.
Oh, thanks, Mike. That was fascinating. Uh, some of the uh, various things that you had to uh, deal with. And I understand that this is a big portion of Daiqua's, uh work nowadays is in the custom area. Is that correct? That is correct. I would estimate that about uh, ooh, about 60% or more of uh, what we do is um, has some form of customization to it. I mean, clearly we, we do a lot of standard stuff as well, um, but uh, much of our work is, is in the area of customization for sure. So uh, those of you that are attending, would, and uh, please stick around. I know we're going to get into a, some nice questions. And if you do have a question, go into the uh, control panel for your GoToWebinar session. And let's um, go ahead and type in the uh, question that you have. And uh, I'll see it, or Mike will see it, and we'll be happy to, um, you know, to get to those questions uh, for you here. Um, I do have a quick question about uh, one of the projects that you had done, Mike, and that was the um, elevator, the construction elevator. Yeah. Uh, what were we looking at in terms of um, payloads? Uh, you know, how much weight would a system like that be able to handle? That particular application, the customer was looking for at least 10,000 pounds. That's five is, tons or so. That's five it? tons. Yeah, that's a lot. So, I mean, if you, for instance, you go into an elevator, um, in a typical building, you know, they'll have like a thousand pounds or 1500 pound uh, weight limits to them and so on. But uh, in this case, they wanted 10,000 pounds because they, they need to be able to, to bring construction materials up and down. Now, keep in mind that when a building goes up, the elevator is one of the last things that gets installed because that has to be up on the absolute top of the building. So they have no access to construction elevators until the building is almost completed. So if you've got a building that's a hundred some odd stories tall, uh, everything has to be brought up from the outside. Oh, that's amazing. Boy, that's a lot of weight to lift there, isn't it? Um, okay, uh, one of our attendees was asking about uh, a copy of the slides being available, and I just wanted to let you know that uh, we're actually making a video recording of this that we're going to uh, distribute and make available from our Power Transmissions Engineering website. Uh, you'll be getting a link uh, tomorrow morning in about 24 hours from now with the uh, location of that video. And uh, we hope that you enjoy the replay on demand so you can check out uh, Mike's. If uh, For those of you that want to share it with your friends, you're welcome to do that. Um, okay, uh, we have another question here. Um, did you want to take a look at this one, Mike? Uh, it says, um, what coatings or material solutions uh, can you use to address different corrosive environments and also FDA rated environments? There are a number of things that we can do along those lines. We have a full paint shop here in our facility as well. Uh, typically for food, <coughs> excuse me, there's a couple of different options. Uh, one of the most common ones is an FDA white epoxy, which is a epoxy that we source uh, that is FDA approved for food service applications. There are antimicrobial coatings that we have shot. Um, typically, we also use a polyurethane. It's a two-part uh, process. It's like an epoxy, if you will, except it's a polyurethane. Um, there are different coatings we can do depending on the materials. Uh, nickel plating is one. Uh, I mentioned steel it paint uh, was another solution that, that we've done quite often. Um, you know, there's, there's really a whole variety. We've also uh, have the availability of stainless steel. A number of the gearboxes that we provide in the smaller sizes are available in all stainless construction as well, including the housings. But stainless is a, a relatively expensive alternative. Um, and very often people can, if it's not directly in the area that's exposed to where food is and so forth, um, and it's, for instance, uh, you know, inside a cabinet or whatever, then the white epoxy or the... Um, microbial paints are, are a much uh, less expensive alternative. And speaking of size, are there size restrictions to a custom solution? Uh, we saw some big gearbox, uh, the, how about sm on the small end of things? Well, small, we can go pretty tiny, um, especially in the servo world. There are uh, NEMA 17, which, <clears throat> excuse me, these are Gearboxes with uh, three-eighths output shafts on them, uh, up to gearboxes that have five-inch diameter output shafts. So from, you know, uh, super sub-fractional uh, input motors to, 
we have gearboxes where we are mounting, as I showed you earlier, we had that one where we're mounting a 400, now in this case, a 500 horsepower electric motor driving it. So, but to be frank, uh, the sweet spot in most of the people that we deal with is probably in the sub-fractional to, let's say, 30 horsepower range. And um, one of our uh, attendees is asking about uh, why didn't they paint the shaft in the stainless steel paint instead of chroming it? Um, because they actually have to use that shaft. Uh, it has, it's, it's actually on the top of that shaft, they're mounting a... <clears throat> they're mounting a pulley and um, to be able to mount it, painting obviously adds a certain thickness to it and paint can scratch. And most of the people that we deal with generally don't like to use uh, paint in, if they're trying to do corrosion resistance because it can scratch. And, and that's why, uh, so it's a little bit of a trade-off. Um, so if you've got to do something that's plated or something that's made from a, a non-corroding material, that's obviously a lot more expensive. Um, so in this case, because it was a shaft and had to hold size and you had to attach components to it, they didn't want to use paint. Right, so if the component is coming on or off and uh, scratches the paint or the coating on the shaft, then you'd end up having a big problem having to go back and figure out how to repaint it or whatever and add more thickness to it, right? Correct. Yeah, yeah. Oh, this is fantastic. Um, I had asked you a little bit uh, about 3D printing in your business. Could you uh, tell us a little bit about uh, how uh, you're utilizing 3D printing in uh, designing these uh, custom gearboxes? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Actually, we don't we don't use a lot of 3D printing in the sense of making, <clears throat> excuse me, components like housings and things like that. But where we are using a lot more 3D printing right now is um, on the input flanges of servo applications. Uh, very often, well, actually in the servo world, there's no standardization for the for the motor dimensions uh, like there is for NEMA or IEC, um, you know, the AC side of the world of motors. In the, in the servo motor realm, every motor manufacturer has a different mounting dimension. So there are many different mounting plates that we typically have to stock and we can't stock them all. So what we find wind up doing is if uh, a customer is buying a handful of units for prototyping or what have you, we make those input flanges using a 3D printing process because it's far more inexpensive than actually machining the, the, the units out of aluminum in low quantity. And the material that we use is uh, really kind of interesting. It's a Kevlar um, carbon fiber material and its tensile strength and other mechanical characteristics are actually stronger uh, than aluminum. And we can print these flange plates in a matter of a couple of hours. And you know, you just plug in the, the, uh, the program and you make a 3D drawing of the, of the flange plate, you, you download it into the machine and you walk away and uh, three to four hours later, depending on the size, you got a plate. And uh, our customers uh, seem to accept them very nicely. They, they, they look kind of cool. They're a black material. Um, and we can hold uh, very tight tolerances actually in a 3D printing, which was something that was important to us when we selected the equipment. So we are using it more and more. And, um, and, and it's actually a fascinating technology for us and it actually solves another problem, cost problem. Uh, kind of a futuristic approach to uh, problems. Kind of. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, one of our attendees, Mike, is asking um, about how long it takes to go from like the design of a custom uh, application to when it would be delivered. Uh, it can be very quick and it also can take a little bit of time. If it's a pure custom from the ground up, then we typically obviously have to do a lot of uh, design work, all the design work ahead of time, obviously. We spend a considerable amount of time working with the customer, asking a whole lot of questions. Very often, we ask for their uh, 3D drawings of their equipment itself, where we can then design the gearbox into their system, make sure that you know from a um, from a form and a fit function that everything is correct, and then we work through the um, all of the calculations for sizing the gears, uh, speeds, motion profiles, and so forth. So. When you're doing a full up design, it is typically a gearbox takes about realistically two to three to four weeks to design. 
and then to fabricate, uh, depending on uh, one of the companies that we that we work with is a uh, spar bevel manufacturer out of northern Germany called Tandler. Uh, they can fabricate these gearboxes uh, in about 10 to 12 weeks, start to finish. 10 to 12 weeks, uh-huh, uh-huh. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, regarding that uh, ceramic paint system that you showed us, uh, where the four pinions rotate in the same direction, Yes. One of our attendees is asking, does that mean the gearbox has two wheel gears? The the gearbox has, um, uh, if, if you look at the actual gearbox, there is a through shaft. And on that through shaft, there is a, I'm going to call it a main ring gear. That, that gear gets pressed onto that shaft. Each of the pinions... Uh, the four pinions that are exiting that uh, that particular gearbox driving those four rollers, each of those pinions has a gear on it, and that's actually part of the output shaft itself because it's a one-piece design. So there's one main gear uh, that's mounted to the through shaft, which is the ring gear, and then four pinions mesh with that round ring gear. So you would say it has, uh, uh, you're not using wheel gears at all essentially on that then? Uh, well, there's spiral bevels that, right? for one thing. Yeah, so there's a, there's a, there's five gears inside that particular gearbox. Uh huh. Uh huh. And then one for the through shaft. There you go. All right. Um, and uh, we uh, have another person here that's asking. Um, uh, in his application, he needs more than one output from the reducer. Could you explain a little bit about what that means and how you would resolve that? Yeah, I mean, uh, as you as you mentioned, very. I mean, the example that we just did needed four outputs out of that particular gearbox, and um, so f typically, what we need to understand is where do those outputs need to be, <coughs> and how are they oriented relative to the input. Um, and once we understand that, then we can come up with a design solution that that'll solve that particular issue. So. Um, as I, as I showed you some of those so-called Franken boxes before, uh, the, 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 one of the last couple of slides on the presentation, you had a spiral bevel going into a inline planetary, and you had a spiral bevel going into a right angle planetary. Um, but we also have at our, excuse me, at our disposal, uh, worm type gearboxes. We have helical bevels, we have parallel shaft units, we have Basically, any kind of gearbox configuration that you can more or less envision, we have at our disposal. It's part of our uh, part of our uh, family of products that we offer. I mean, if you if you go to the website at dykwa.com and you go to the product section, you will see a, a very large graphical and, and pictorial representation of all the different types of gear technologies that we have at our disposal. And depending on what the customer is looking for, we then try to figure out how to create. Um, you know, the input configuration they need and how the output configuration needs to be associated to the input in terms of speed, ratio, orientation, and so on. Excellent, excellent. Uh, and let's take one last question then from a member of our audience, Mike, if that sounds good to you. Yeah, sure. All right, um, and then we'll wrap it up. Um, this uh, attendee asks, when a customer provides a 3D drawing of their machine, can you provide the analysis of your solution and how it might impact the machine? So that would be kind of like an engineering analysis, I think, right? Yeah, we actually have what's called um, FEA software uh, in our CAD system here, which is finite element analysis software. So if they were to supply us, <coughs> excuse me, with uh, the 3D rendering of their equipment and the all the different axes of rotation. So every 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 part of the machine that has to rotate or bend or what have you, we need to know that as well because we can program that in, or we could uh, highlight that in the program. And then um, we have to also input the, the types of um, uh, output torques, input speeds and so on. That's all parameters that we would have from the, from the drive motors and things of that nature. And then let the program run and it will determine um, where the where the stress points are in in a particular piece of equipment, so that we can address okay here's an area where we have too much overhang load, or here's an area where um, the component isn't robust enough for the torque that it's trying to carry, 
or what have you. And that, um, and that is something that we can do. We, we have that ability here and, and we do that from time to time for our customers. Excellent. Well, um, ladies and gentlemen that are attendees here today, I uh, wanted to say thank you very much. And Mike has told me that if you've got a question or a project that you'd like uh, Daiqua to take a look at, please feel free to get a hold of him at the number on your screen, 630-980-1133. And they're on Central Time. They're, and uh, you can also write to him by email at info at diqua.com. And Michael, see these uh, communications from you personally and be more than happy to get back to you about this. And uh, of course, here at Power Transmission Engineering, we're going to be uh, setting up a page with uh, the link to the video on it. So you'll be able to follow up on that as well. So. Mike, on behalf of all of us here at PTE, thanks so much for being our guest here today and for putting together this uh, great presentation that you've done, and we look forward to having you back again. Well, thank you very much, and, and uh, thank you to the audience as well. I appreciate you taking the time to, uh, to kind of listen to us today. Excellent. Well, folks, have a real nice weekend coming up, and uh, this is Gary Jesh from Power Transmission Engineering wishing you all well. Take care and thank you.